on World News Tonight. On alert, Italy continues to combat extreme weather as scorching heat is replaced by hailstorms across the country. Renewed promises. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Secretary of State commits to a new year of regeneration, inner city desegregation and housing delivery across England. Beauty bans. Hair and beauty salons across Afghanistan to be closed in the coming weeks on the Taliban's orders. Bolshoi Ballet. Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet resumes international touring in Beijing following the pandemic. is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and you are watching World News Tonight and we begin in Italy as the country is being struck with bad weather. The intense heat wave that has been gripping Italy began to break up in the northern part of the country. However, it has been replaced by thunderstorms and hail, complete with flood warnings. Wildfires forced the closure of Palermo Airport in Sicily as extreme weather continued to batter Italy with severe storms causing damage and at least two deaths in the north of the country. The airport in the Sicilian capital would remain shut as firefighters were working to put out a major blaze in a nearby area that also disrupted local road and rail traffic. A heat wave has hit southern Europe with scorching temperatures bringing increased risk of fires and deaths. Italy has put 16 cities on red alert because of the high temperatures. These include Palermo and Catania where power and water supply cuts that local officials blamed in part on the heat have been frequent in recent days. Meanwhile, an overnight storm in Milan tore off roofs and uprooted trees, blocking roads and disrupting overground transportation in Italy's financial capital. Two women were killed in northern Monza and Brescia provinces after being crushed by falling trees. Italy is one of the European countries most affected by climate change. Over in the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and levelling up Secretary Michelle Gove insisted that the Conservative administration would meet its 2019 election pledge to build at least a million more homes before the next vote expected in 2024, to which the house builders responded, saying that the UK government's latest plan to boost the number of new dwellings in England is unlikely to help ministers reach their manifesto target on homes. After a by-election bruising, a Prime Minister hoping to turn a corner. It's definitely the way, way forward, right? Yeah. With a policy push on a contentious subject. We're making it easier for people to expand homes upwards and outwards. We're making it easier to build on brownfield sites with more investment and we're investing in the planning system. So taken together, that's a practical approach that will mean more people can own their own home, but we're doing that in the right way. But action in places like Cambridgeshire, where the government wants to build a new urban quarter, is already facing resistance. From the public and the local MP here too, who tweeted to say, I'll do everything I can to stop the government's nonsense plans to impose mass house building on Cambridge. He blamed a shortage of water in the area already, not being able to resource any more homes. How to provide enough housing for a growing population? It's one of the burning challenges of our time, a challenge that may well become a big election battleground. Moving on to the more legal troubles in the U.S. as the Department of Justice sued the state of Texas and uh, Governor Greg Abbott for building a floating barrier at the southern border that the state says will deter migrants, but what the Biden administration calls a threat to public safety. The U.S. Justice Department sued Texas on Monday over floating barriers installed by the state in the Rio Grande to block migrants crossing from Mexico. Texas authorities began installing a string of buoys in the middle of the river near Eagle Pass in the state's southwest last week. It's part of Republican Governor Greg Abbott's so-called Operation Lone Star initiative to deter migrants. In a statement, U.S. Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta said prosecutors believe the move to install the barriers without federal authorization flouted federal law. And that, quote, this floating barrier poses threats to navigation and public safety and presents humanitarian concerns. The department had ordered Abbott to remove the structures in a letter last week, threatening legal action. Abbott defied the warning. He instead sent a letter on Monday to Democratic President Joe Biden, accusing him of failing to enforce immigration laws and causing what he called a record-breaking level of illegal immigration. 
Abbott told the barriers have potentially prevented hundreds of thousands of people from entering the country illegally, saying, quote, We believe we have the right to do so, and we will take this lawsuit all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The number of migrants caught crossing the U.S.-Mexico border illegally has dropped since Biden implemented a restrictive new asylum policy in May. Even so, authorities caught roughly 100,000 of them in June. Mexico has also complained about the floating barriers, saying it violates a water treaty and may encroach on Mexican territory. Most pollsters saw Spain's far-right Vox in role, but none imagined that it would exile Catalan separatist leader Carlos Puigdemont, emerging as kingmaker from Spain's inclusive snap election. Spain's election on Sunday ended in a hung parliament and what one newspaper called instability. Now former Catalan regional government head Carlos Puigdemont unexpectedly finds himself a potential kingmaker. That's after no bloc on the left or right won enough seats to form a majority. He lives in self-imposed exile in Belgium since leading a failed push to split Catalonia from Spain in 2017. One path forward could be for Socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez to secure a vote in favour, or at least an abstention, in a parliamentary vote on forming a government from Puigdemont's Junts party. That could be in exchange for further concessions on independence. Junts party spokesperson Miriam Nogueras. Our priority is Catalonia, not the governability of the Spanish state. The centre-right People's Party and the far-right Vox won the most seats in Parliament with a combined 169, short of the 176 seats needed for a majority and confounding poll predictions. The ruling Socialists and far-left Sumer Party won 153, but have more possibilities for negotiating support from small Basque and Catalan separatist parties. Sanchez could win over left-wing separatist party ERC, but he'll likely also need the backing of the more hard-line Junts, which has not supported Sanchez in the past four years. Puigdemont, who still wields considerable influence within Junts, said in mid-July the party would not support Sanchez because he was unreliable. He faces trial for his role in the 2017 independence bid. He was stripped of the immunity he had as a member of the European Parliament earlier this month, paving the way for his extradition. Now over in Israel, mass demonstrations spread across the country after the government passed a controversial law restricting the power of the country's judiciary system. The Israeli government says that a series of planned reforms will strengthen democracy in the country. The Israeli government on Monday passed the controversial bill that's triggered some of the biggest protests in the country's history. By the evening of the same day, protests against the bill had spread nationwide as thousands of people blocked roads and clashed with police in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem and other parts of the country. The so-called reasonableness bill prevents Israel's Supreme Court from overruling government decisions that it considers senseless. It was approved by 64 votes to zero after the opposition boycotted the final vote. The passing of this law is the first of a broader set of judicial reforms which the government has set out to correct what it describes as a power imbalance. Demonstrations on the streets of Israel have been taking place weekly since the start of the year in an effort to protect what protesters say is an attack on democracy. And at the end of last week, leading up to the parliamentary voting, tens of thousands of protesters marched some 70 kilometers from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and set up camp in a park between the Knesset, which is Israel's parliament, and the Supreme Court. On Monday morning, protesters blocking a boulevard outside the Knesset were sprayed by a water cannon and pulled off the road by police against the backdrop of drums, whistles and air horns. Injuries and arrests have been reported. Meanwhile, the government says the series of planned reforms serve to strengthen democracy in the country and that the reasonableness bill was necessary because the Supreme Court had occurred too much power over politics in recent decades. The controversial reforms have polarized Israel, triggering one of the most serious domestic crises in the country's history. Former heads of Israel's security services, chief justices and prominent legal and business figures have also been vocal against the government's reforms. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news.
Welcome back. Now the migrant crisis continues as even more migrants have been rescued in the Mexican border after being abandoned by their guide. And President Biden is sending a top White House official to Mexico for talks on fighting the fentanyl crisis and getting a, hand, a handle on the migration in the region. This is the heartbreaking moment. A group of migrants, including a child, were rescued after being abandoned by their guide on their journey to the United States. The group moved to tears after being located alive in the unforgiving Baja California terrain. That rescue, just one in a string of operations by Mexican officials that helped recover more than 600 migrants last week. On Friday and Saturday alone, Mexican authorities say they located more than 320 migrants left inside trailer boxes, all abandoned by their drivers. You can see them climbing their way out after officials say they were left behind. In addition to the precarious conditions, migrants have reported being medicated along the journey. Los migrantes son incluso drogados para que puedan eh, resistir y transitar en esas condiciones tan, tan crudas y tan despreciables como lo tratan los traficantes. Last week, Mexican officials say they heard similar reports after they found more than 200 migrants in the back of an abandoned truck. There, some claimed they were sedated, medicated to inhibit their basic needs. Many seen with bracelets wrapped around their arms to identify them and crammed in the back of a trailer box, adapted to avoid X-ray detection. North Korea has invited a Chinese delegation for the upcoming Victory Day as the first official foreign guest since COVID-19. Speculation rises over whether this could see the regime gearing up to open up its border after the pandemic is. After three years and six months, North Korea is set to receive its first foreign delegation. It is inviting a Chinese delegation to mark the 70th anniversary of the armistice of the Korean War on Thursday, known as Victory Day by the regime. According to the North Korean Central News Agency on Monday, the invited Chinese delegation is led by Li Hongzong, a member of the Political Bureau of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Li's rank is lower than that of Li Chanshu, then Chinese top legislator who visited the regime in 2018 for the 70th anniversary of the foundation of the communist state. But his visit will mark the very first official visit by foreign guests in a shift in policy. Since the COVID-19 outbreak in 2020, North Korea has closed its borders, only partially resuming cargo transportation with China last year. The only known case of foreign guests visiting the regime was back in March when China's new ambassador to North Korea, Wang Yajun, took up the post. North Korea has also been taking part in international events with ambassador-level representatives already overseas. This includes the ASEAN Regional Forum for the past three years, with this year's forum also attended by its ambassador to Indonesia, Ang Guang Il, instead of its foreign minister, Choi Sun Hee. Observers largely see the North's first post-pandemic foreign guests coming from China as an apparent show of their ties against South Korea, the U.S. and Japan. But eyes are on whether the two could resume other exchanges, perhaps in flights and trains, or keep it at high-level diplomacy for the time being. Now moving on to the recent tech updates, as the Twitter logo has officially been changed, the tech billionaire replaced the company's bluebird silhouette with an X, a term for what he has described as an everything app. After 17 years under the bluebird, Twitter signaled its rebrand to the name X by grounding its iconic logo. Workers took it off the company's San Francisco headquarters Monday in preparation for Elon Musk's renaming of the platform. Martin Grassner, one of the three designers behind the Bluebird logo, told he was sad to see it go. It represents the best of the Internet's adolescence. And I think that it recalls a time when we, a lot of people, I don't mean this to sound cynical, but believed more in the power of the Internet. The rebranding is part of Elon Musk's longer-term goal of shifting it toward an everything app in three to five years. Musk has said he envisions an app that could give users services beyond social media, like peer-to-peer -peer payments. 
The idea mirrors WeChat, a wildly popular app in China whose pay services can be used almost anywhere in that country. Hashtag Goodbye Twitter was trending on Twitter on Monday with reference to the old logo as well as criticism from users about the new one. Marketing and branding experts say the rebrand risks throwing away years of Twitter's name recognition. I think losing the iconic Twitter logo and the birdie Users are not going to love that. Wetbush Securities Managing Director Daniel Ives told the move was risky. When you lose an iconic logo like that, rebrands are dangerous. And now clearly back against the wall for Twitter, and you're seeing that rebrand from start to finish. But I think knee-jerk, this probably detracts from the value that you use the iconic Twitter birdie. In a recent investor presentation, Twitter revealed a business revamp to focus more on video and commerce, led by its new chief executive, Linda Yaccarino, who formerly worked at NBC Universal. After Musk acquired Twitter in October, the social media giant faced months of chaos. It laid off thousands of staff, faced criticism over lax content moderation, and an exodus of advertisers who did not want their ads appearing next to inappropriate content. There are grim days in sight for Afghanistan's cosmetic industry. After years of hard work and huge investments to build their businesses, Afghan women are closing their beauty salons for good before the Taliban's ban on salons for women comes into effect. These salon employees are getting ready to shut up shop for what could be the last time. The Taliban's ban on beauty salons for women in Afghanistan comes into effect on Tuesday. An estimated 12,000 beauty businesses are likely to shutter. The ban will also put more than 60,000 women out of a job, adding further strain on an economy already in crisis. These beauticians are among those who invested large sums to get their businesses off the ground. I'm experiencing one of the worst and darkest days of my life, total absolute disappointment. We started our work with lots of passion and enthusiasm, but unfortunately everything is over now. When I heard this announcement, I got very upset. Day by day, the Taliban are trying to eliminate women from society somehow. They ban schools, universities and the employment of women. Day by day, they are increasing the restrictions. As well as beauty services, the salons provided many Afghan women with a safe, female-only space where they could meet outside their homes and without a male chaperone. Faced with rapidly diminishing options, dozens of women staged a rare protest against the ban. Footage shot by the protesters shows the Taliban using water cannons to break up the demonstration. The morality ministry said the ban on salons was based on an order from the supreme spiritual leader. Similar orders have led to the closure of high schools and universities to women and stopped many Afghan female aid staff from working. The Taliban administration say they respect women's rights in line with their interpretation of Islamic law and Afghan culture. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida condemned the late-night launch of two ballistic missiles by North Korea hours after a U.S. nuclear-powered submarine arrived at a naval base in South Korea. Russia launched its sixth air attack this month on Kyiv. The military administration of the Ukrainian capital has said, with air raid alerts blaring for more than three hours over the city and east half of the country. Eurozone business activity shrank much more than expected in July as demand in the bloc's dominant services industry declined, adding to the difficulty of this week's decision on rates by the European Central Bank. Luxury giant LVMH unveiled a deal to sponsor next year's Olympic Games in Paris with top fashion brands Louis Vuitton and Dior, Moet NNC Champagne and Spirits labels and jeweler Chaumet, which will design medals for the event. The Jordanian army reported that it had shot down a drone carrying drugs from Syria into its northern frontier region. The plane, which was carrying two kilos of crystal methamphetamine, was intercepted and downed on Jordan's side of the border.
And that wraps up tonight's edition of World News Tonight. And we'll be back again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end tonight with the glamorous Bolshoi ballet dancers who resume international touring, heralding a golden return to the global stage for the crown jewel of Russian culture. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.